Thank you. I would like to address, in terms of brain activity, a single question of huge interest, which is, on the one hand, extremely simple, and on the other hand, extremely complex. Namely, what is beauty? And is there a single characteristic or a single set of characteristics that defines it? The question has been pondered and debated for centuries without adequate resolution. And it was very well summarized by the English art critic Clive Bell, summarized in an experimentally accessible way, in his book called Art, published in 1914, when he asked, what do objects as diverse as Santa Sophia in Istanbul and the windows at Chartres Cathedral in France, Mexican sculpture, a Chinese bowl, Persian carpets, the frescoes of uh, Giotto in Padua, and the masterpieces of Poussin, Piero della Francesca, and Cezanne have in common. Because, he said, either all works of art have something in common, or else when we talk about art, we jibber. Now, you will notice that in this catalogue, these are, this is his list of uh, works of art, not mine. In this list, it is really the all works are visual works of art. But if you look at the philosophy of aesthetics and definitions of beauty, one of the most famous being that of Edmund Burke, beauty is for the greater part a, some quality in bodies acting mechanically upon the human mind by the intervention of the senses. Beauty is uh, not linked to visual beauty or theatrical beauty or poetic beauty or musical beauty, beauty in the abstract. So when we approached the question experimentally, we were, of course, interested in uh, beauty regardless of its source, and therefore we used both musical and visual beauty. The second thing that's interesting to note is that uh, Burke equates art with beauty, but art and beauty have, were brutally separated by Marcel Duchamp when he sent a urinal, which he called uh, euphemistically a the fountain to an art exhibit, because not all works of art, even great works of art, are necessarily experienced as beautiful. So again, in our experiment, we, in our experiment, we, we separate art from beauty and concentrate on beauty alone. Now, because there is no universal standard of beauty and no single set of characteristics uh, that defines beauty uh, that's been agreed upon, um, we chose to concentrate on the beauty as experienced by each individual subject. We had subjects representing different uh, cultures and different ethnic backgrounds and different uh, educational backgrounds, but each subject had to rate what they heard or what they saw uh, on a scale of one to 10 as beautiful or not beautiful. And to, uh, uh, none, of the art, uh, none of the participants in these experiments was actually an artist or a musician because we wanted to avoid knowledge in, the, in, this area, in these areas. So the trick is to ask subjects to come to our lab and view many paintings and listen to many musical excerpts and each one gives his own rating for how beautiful they were or how beautifully they experienced them to be. And then we put them in the scanner where they view these things again and uh, we monitor the activity in their brains. Now let me just explain very briefly that what happens when in an area when, which is especially active, an area of the brain which is especially active, is that its cells respond far more vigorously and their metabolic requirement increases and so more blood is channeled to that part of the brain and this change in blood flow can be captured by the scanners. So let me show you an example of a painting which most people, but not all, uh, rated as very beautiful, the Odalisque by Ang. And here is another painting which most people, but not all, rated as ugly, although it is 
a painting by Lucien Freud of considerable artistic merit in that it projects truths. It was nevertheless not experienced as beautiful by most subjects. And the same is true of uh, uh, musical excerpts. Now, these musical excerpts lasting 16 seconds, just as long as the visual uh, presentations lasted. Most people, most subjects, rated the Adagetto from, uh, they, were, they were actually a lot, uh, they were asked to listen to excerpts of music derived from jazz and classical music and from uh, Eastern and Western cultures. Most people rated the Adagetto from Mahler's Fifth Symphony uh, as beautiful. And most people rated the second violin concerto of Ligeti as ugly, which does not, again, let me emphasize, mean that it doesn't have considerable musical merit. But these were not musicians. They were, we were just asking them about the, their experience when they listened to it. <laughs> right. So these are the stimuli. And when you look at the brain, of course, the um, visual input goes to one part of the brain and the, and the auditory musical input goes to another part of the brain. So here is the um, visual input and that's the auditory input. But when you look to see which parts of the brain are especially active when subjects experience beauty, you find that in addition to the visual areas and other areas which I'll not talk about, there is this area here in the medial orbital frontal cortex, a part of the emotional brain, uh, part of the reward centers of the brain. And when you look at which parts of the brain were active when they experienced musical beauty, you find again, in addition to the auditory areas plus other areas, there is this area here in the medial orbital frontal cortex, which is especially active. And when you add the two, you find there is one area and one area alone which always correlates with the experience of beauty. And hence, we can now answer the question, is there a characteristic or a single set of characteristics that defines beauty? The answer is yes, but the answer comes from a very surprising source. It comes from the brain, not from the works of art. So to that extent, the answer to the question, what is beauty, is rather simple. <coughs> now, if you go back and ask yourself, well, philosophy of aesthetics has been debating for centuries whether judgments of beauty can ever be quantified. And so if you look at visual beauty, here is the area which is active in the medial orbital frontal cortex. And if you look at the strengths of activity there in relation to the declared intensity of the experience of beauty, you find that the more, uh, the higher the experience of beauty, the higher the activity as measured by the change in blood flow. And if you look at musical beauty, you get much the same picture um, as uh, the, uh, w with musical excerpts that are experienced as very beautiful, the activity is much more intense in that area than with musical excerpts which are uh, deemed to be indifferent or ugly. And the same is true for ugliness, by the way. Uh, stimuli which are rated as ugly activate a different system, a different part of the brain, uh, the amygdala here and the motor cortex there, as if you are <coughs> the, mobilizing the motor system to protect yourself against ugliness. <laughs> and uh, again, if you look at the intensity of activity in these areas in relation to the declared experience of ugliness or beauty, you'd find that the uglier the stimulus, the more intense the activity in the amygdala or in the motor cortex. So that, uh, and I think it's a very important point to get across, that for the first time in human history, subjective mental states, subjective mental states which belong in our private world, can actually not only be localized, but can be quantified. Now, in the word literature of love, beauty is linked with desire and with love. So is there any link in the brain 
to, uh, to mirror the link that you find in that world literature? And the answer is yes. Without going into this experiment in great detail, let me just tell you that when people look at events or persons or objects that they desire, um, and rate them in exactly the same way in which they rated the, the uh, musical and the visual excerpts, you'll find that there is one area, a common area of activity located here in the medial orbital frontal cortex, which happens to be the area which is active when uh, you experience beauty, and also happens to be the area which is active when you look at the, pace, uh, at the face of a person you love very much. So, let me reiterate again, the simple answer to a complex question is, uh, yes, there is a single characteristic which uh, defines the experience of beauty, and that characteristic resides in the brain. Now, this raises, of course, very tricky questions, and now comes the complex part, the complex answer. When you look at a painting like that, which you qualify as beautiful, the activity goes through the retina, uh, the optic pathways, to the primary optic cortex, to the specialized areas that uh, are specialized for detecting and processing bodies, and then goes to the medial orbital frontal cortex, somehow, and you experience beauty. And when you experience all, uh, a, a, the same category of painting as ugly, the pathways from the retina to, to the cortex up to this region are the same. But from then on, signals are sent off to another area. So there must be some kind of filter somewhere in the brain which decides, some system, some mechanism which decides where to send the signals to. And uh, there you go back to the definition, and it's wonderful uh, for us in science that we've got such a rich history in philosophy and in history of art, which we can rely on for inspiration. If you look at the definition of Edmund Burke, beauty is for the most part some quality in bodies acting mechanically upon the human mind by the intervention of the senses. And the next task for neuroesthetics, for the next TED talk, will be to understand what that intervention means. That problem is a general problem of huge interest for neurobiology because there are many areas in the brain and each one of them has multiple outputs and each one of them must act as some kind of filter mechanism for sending signals to one area or to the other. And that is the complex part of the answer. Thank you.